thank you all for coming out here today. I didn't quite get around to shake everybody's hand yet, but hopefully before we leave today, we'll make that happen. Um, we all know the nation is at a critical point yes. in our history. We're finally, finally at the point where we are more prosperous, where our economy's thriving, where we are increased, uh, we have increased safety, where we have increased security. Um, and what do the radical leftist Democrats want to do? All they want to do is pull us backwards and pull us backwards and resist and wear their little pink hats and throw fits and throw conservatives out of restaurants. I don't know, you know, their, their, their message is not good. And, and I was talking to a lot of you back here, um, you know, the direction our country in is, is hanging in the balance here in this next election. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, we cannot let what the leftists want to happen, happen. We have got to stop it. Yep. And in Arizona, we've got a big decision to make come August. We're going to start voting in about 30 days. So you all know, early voting starts in about 30 days. Unbelievable. And about 80% of the people vote early. So we got to make sure our message gets out there. Um, but when we vote, we have a choice. Now, are we going to elect another senator in the mold of Jeff Blake and John McCain? No. no. All right, I love to hear that because what I think we're going to do, what I know we're going to do, is we are going to elect an America First champion. I consider this a job interview. I know all of you, have, well, maybe with our, the exception of our young Republican, uh, you know, uh, young conservative, have gone to a job interview, right? You've all gone, um, and you weren't hired based on a piece of fluffy mail that came in your mailbox, and you weren't hired because somebody saw a commercial about you, right? I mean, you actually had to interview. You had to build a relationship. You had to uh, put your, your skills out there on the table and then convince somebody that they wanted to hire you. I want you to hire me. I want you to hire me not just to be the next senator because we've only had 12 senators in our history and we've got an open seat. That in itself is amazing. So I do want to be lucky number 13, just so you know. <laughs> um, and, and so I want you to hire me to be your senator, but I also want you to think about this. Whenever you're hiring anybody and you're electing them, you're actually hiring them to be you. You're, you are hiring them to be your voice, to be your backbone, to be the person that brings your great ideas to the table, in my case, to the floor of the United States Senate. We have to have those real relationships if we want what our founders told us we could have, which is a representative republic. We can't, I can't represent you if I don't know you. I can't represent you if I don't listen to you. I can't represent you if I don't show up in front of you. And somehow we've allowed the political class across the board to make us think that they're up here and we're down there and never should our paths cross because they are so superior, they're so elite. Uh, and that just simply is not the case. So we are going to have an opportunity for you to hire an America First Senator in just, you know, just a couple of months. So I look forward to uh, having all of you want to hire me before we leave this room. I want to touch on a few of my policy passions, the things that I want to achieve when I get to Washington, D.C. Uh, um, and I'm going to try to keep it short, but there's so many awesome stories that go in, 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 this, um, in these policy passions, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short because I really do want to hear from you. I want to hear your questions. I want to hear your concerns. And answering questions is one of my favorite parts because most people that are politicians refuse to answer questions or answer only a couple that are planted in the audience and then they wave their hand and they, they're off to their next event or they're just off to escape in their SUV. So, uh, so my policy passions, I'm, I'm going to list them first. Build the wall. <laughs> Repeal Obamacare. but understand we must cut spending too. Yeah. And last but certainly not least, make sure our military is strong and we take care of our veterans. Yeah. If we do those four things, we are well on 
our way to keeping America great in 2018, 2020, and beyond. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So, okay, so immigration. I have to tell you, you know, immigration is, is really the thing I am the most passionate about because illegal immigration has affected every aspect of society. Healthcare, education, public safety, corrections, our very American way of life has all been affected by illegal immigration. And our lax immigration laws and our wide open border have been exploited again and again and again, and it's gotta stop. Yes. That's why I've been a strong proponent of build the wall, not the wall system, not the comprehensive immigration reform line, not the baloney that you hear out of Washington. Build the wall. <coughs> Build the wall first and foremost, uh, because it's not only a symbol of a right and wrong way to come into this country, it is also a significant barrier to the bad guys that are on the other side who want to bring bad things into our country. And a lot of people will say, oh, you just hate people on the other side. No. How many people lock their doors at home? Lock their doors, lock their car? I mean, I do. Not because I hate the people out there. I love the people inside so much. I want to protect them. And that's what a, a wall will do for us. And the people who are fighting against it, they know that not having a wall hasn't worked. Um, and they know that having a wall does. So many of the people who are, are wishy-washy on the wall understand that we could actually solve a big problem that's facing our country. Now, I've been down to the border, uh, unlike some people uh, that, that, uh, that run for office. I've been down there many times, uh, both as a state senator when I was running against Senator McCain the last time and this time. I was down in Yuma in April. I was down in Tucson, the Tucson sector, Yuma sector, Tucson sector in March. So Yuma, we, we have some good things uh, on our border. Yuma's doing a lot of things right. It's one of the most secure of the 12 sectors across the southern border. It wasn't always the case. Uh, went down there. Yvonne went with me. Where are you, Yvonne? Yvonne's, right. Yvonne's our, our finance chair. You'll hear from her later. But uh, Yvonne went down with me, and um, and Mike went with me, and we got to see the border with Sheriff Wilmot, the, the county sheriff. And he told us that before they had the, the wall, they don't have a, um, a wall wall, but they have a three-layer, very significant fence. But before they had that, they experienced what they called bonsai attacks where 50 or 100 or even 200 people from Mexico would storm the border because they knew they would overwhelm the resources that we had, whether it was border patrol or sheriffs or law enforcement of any kind, and that most would be able to get into the country and, and go free and never to be found again. A few of them would get caught. They understood that. But for the most part, they'd just be let go, and they could go back home, and they could try again in the next bonsai attack and see if they could be one of the ones that was a faster runner or you know, was able to, to, to get in that time. Uh, but since that, that border fence has been up, there hasn't been one, not one bonsai attack. People are actually coming to the ports of entry and doing it the right way. So that, that's some of the symbolism and the deterrent. Now, Tucson sector. It's, a, it's another story. It's probably the least secure of the 12, 12 sectors across the southern border. Uh, I, when I went down, I got to go down with a rancher named Jim Chilton. And he is, he is just a gem of a man. He's, uh, his family's been in Arizona for five generations. He's been in southern Arizona ranching this piece of property for about 30 years. And so he took me down to the border. He's got 50,000 acres plus that he ranches and about 20 miles of it are right on the border with Mexico. Just boop, right there. So, well, I mean, see this line? Well, maybe some of you all can't, but there's a line on the ground. That's about how secure the border is. Uh, it's just a line because what is supposed to be securing the border? It's four little flimsy strands of barbed wire. And that's it. That's what's between us and between Mexico. Now, Mr. Chilton is, is uh, he's a funny guy too. He's the uh, he wants to prove his point. And so he's a cowboy, jeans, boots, hat with dirt, you know, because it's not just for photos, it's actually for work, sidearm, and he's 79 years old. And so he, he gets down on the ground and he wriggles under the barbed wire fence, stands up on the other side and says, look, I'm in Mexico, you know, uh, pushes that top wire down and then just steps back over like a good cowboy could, should, I guess, and says, I'm back. And he said, look, if I can do that, anybody can. 
anybody came. Sure. And he told me, you know, because he's been down there a long time, he's seen a change in the kind of people that are coming across the border. He said 10, 15 years ago, he called it the migrants, called the people the migrants. They were mostly men who wanted to come to the United States. They wanted to work hard, especially in our ag industry, agriculture, and in construction. They wanted to make money to make a better life for themselves and their family back in Mexico. They wanted to go back to Mexico. No interest in being a citizen. No interest in flying the Mexican flag. No interest in standing in front of the Capitol in, in Phoenix or in Washington, D.C., demanding things from the country. Now, there's a right way for them to come, too. Um, they, they shouldn't be just coming in and trying to work. Uh, I'd love to see us have a stronger guest worker program for just for people like that. Uh, but he said in the last, you know, eight to ten years, he's seen a big, big change. It's not the migrants anymore. He says it's people associated with the druggers. And the druggers are the drug cartel. The drug cartel who is trafficking in drugs and in guns. And, and in people, people. And, and that, that really should ring a humanitarian bell in your heart because those, the, the people that are at the top of the drug cartel, I mean, they're not dumb people. They know our laws are lax. They know our borders open. They know everything that they can to exploit what we have to offer. And they figured out that they could sell a drug once and they could sell a gun once, but they could sell a woman or they could sell a little child again and again and again. And that, anybody who says that they are for women and children should be shouting from the mountaintops to build the wall. We are seeing it down, you know, right now with the asylum seekers. You know, we've had 50,000 people a month for three months trying to get into the country. We've had a 300 plus percent increase in fraudulent families at the border. 12,000 kids in custody, 10,000 came without their parents. Uh, the exploitation of these children, and these women too, is coming not on our side of the border, but from the other side, from the people who understand. Uh, our, our team was kind of talking about, uh, about this, and they said, if the drug cartel knew, if you were carrying a blue bag, and you could just walk into the country and you were going to get expedited privileges, they'd make sure that every one of their people had a blue bag. The sad, sad truth is that instead of a blue bag, it's a kid, it's a child, it's a baby, it's a toddler, it's a teenager that has become their Get Into America free card. And they've, they understood it under Obama and they're still trying it today. It, it boils my blood to think about the way the left and the media, and even some on the right, are portraying our Border Patrol agents. Because our Border Patrol agents are brave men and women. They have really the toughest job in, in the Department of Homeland Security. It's the lowest paid job and it's the most dangerous. They are more likely to be assaulted or killed than anybody else in DHS. And so, whenever, I, I, I was watching the, the fake news on CNN, yeah, sorry, uh, uh, <laughs> they had, um, I think it was KCDC, the girl that has the show called oh, yeah. KCDC, and she had a Border Patrol agent on, and she started to give it to him about how he's a terrible person and he's separating families. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we are family people. I'm a dad myself, and you don't know the things that we've seen. We've seen 12-year-old girls whose parents put them on birth control because they knew that they were going to be raped multiple times as they came across that desert and tried to get into our country. They've seen four-year-olds with the only connection to their parents that's left is their phone number is written on their t-shirt with a magic marker. They even have seen little kids die. They said they had a nine-year-old little boy who died of heat stroke with not a, a shred of families anywhere around. Our open border allows those things to happen. It's got to stop. And the only way we're going to stop it is to build the wall. I, I just had an op-ed this morning in the Washington Examiner. So if you all haven't seen it yet, please go. It's on my Facebook page. It's on my website. Go and share that far and wide because it basically talks about the, uh, the false promises of amnesty. You know, because offering amnesty, any kind of amnesty, is just a magnet for other, you know, more, more people to try to get to our country illegally as quickly as they possibly can. We've got to turn it off. We have to learn from our mistakes of the past. Ronald Reagan, okay, my, one of my favorite presidents. Anybody else? Anybody else love Reagan? Yeah. 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 Ronald Reagan, 
and, and his, his campaign manager in his re-election is one of my senior advisors, Ed Rollins. You've probably seen him on TV. I saw him last night. He was great. It, he got cut off a little bit or on Sunday by uh, Maria Bartiromo just for a hard break. But he's right on target. And he told me that one of President Reagan's biggest disappointments as, as president was granting amnesty and then trusting Congress yeah. to deliver on border security. Yeah. We can't trust them. I'm sorry. We can't trust them, and they're trying the same game right now. Okay, we're still dealing with the fallout from the 1986 amnesty. That's why we, we are where we are. We've had politician after politician after politician walk along. Who this reminds you of? Let's finally build the dang fence. You know, I mean, uh, and then what did he do? He never built the dang fence. Uh, Jeff Lake's been an open borders guy forever. In his book, he talked about how he used to try to distract the border. Oh, yeah. We did buy one of those 2,000 copies because we needed a proposition research. Uh, but, uh, but he said in that book that um, he used to try to distract the Border Patrol so that the people that were working illegally for their family's business could escape. Uh, Martha McSally, she said again and again and again, a wall won't work. Uh, yeah, a wall won't work. President Trump, you know, is an albatross around her neck. Somebody that's going to hand the, uh, that Trump is going to hand the gavel back to Nancy Pelosi. We've had enough of those kind of politicians yes. who haven't done what needs to be done. With this Goodlap bill, okay, the Goodlap bill is sold to us as a bill of goods, I'm just telling you, because it is amnesty. They've called it legalization, uh, for blanket legalization of a population. And they also have funny business in funding the wall, okay? They want to say there's a trust fund or there's a reserve fund set aside to build the wall down the road. If you don't know, Current Congresses can't force future Congresses to spend money. The money has to be appropriated now in one fell swoop. It can't be. Anybody that's on Social Security knows what a Social Security trust fund is like with the sticky fingers of the Washington, D.C. Uh, elite political class. It is not locked up in any sense of the word, and it puts us in danger. So um, don't be fooled whenever they say that was the conservative bill. I can tell you we've got two great conservative congressmen right now that, that I really like. Uh, got Paul Gosar, who's my congressman, and Andy Biggs, who I work with. Yeah. Yeah. And both of those fine men voted no. Voted no on the Goodlap bill, as did Steve King, who endorses me. He's out of Iowa, strong border hawk, also very, very um, vocally pro-life. Uh, um, Dana Rohrbacher out of California, also supporting me, also voted no on that bill. So um, the media wants you to think that, that conservatives are the ones that are standing in the way of progress. Well, if the progress is towards open borders, is towards massive amnesty across the board, um, without, without doing any of the things that were promised on the campaign trail in 2016, of course we're going to try to stop that because we have to fund and build the wall. We have to end, end the diversity lotto, end chain migration, defund sanctuary cities, make sure that we have accountability measures in place for, for uh, employers and employees. We have to do all of those things before we can start talking about what to do with people who came here illegally and are inside the country for whatever reason, and also how we're going to deal with the people coming into our country uh, the, the right way. or, or you know. The ones that are trying to come the wrong way, we should just stop them from coming into the country. I think the president tweeted it out today. Yeah. He's like, hiring all these judges and doing all this, that's just a big waste of time and money. Just turn them around and send them back. Yeah. 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 So as you can see, I'm pretty passionate about that. Okay, and so I'll try to be shorter on my other passions. But I mean, Obamacare has got to go. It's yes. the reason I got into politics was to fight against the biggest takeover of healthcare liberty and healthcare freedom by the government that we as patients and, and me as a physician will ever see in our lifetime. Uh, what, what they have shoved down our throats certainly hasn't worked. Premiums and deductibles are sky high. M many people in this room probably can't afford to access the system in the way that maybe you, you need to. We aren't getting the healthcare that we want, the healthcare that we need, or the healthcare that we deserve. The government expects to provide something and expect us basically to get down on our knees and be thankful to them, even if it isn't what we need. So 
we've got to get rid of it. And you notice I didn't say and replace. Because uh, you know, full repeal has to be done. And as a doctor, I know that if you find a cancer in a person, you cut it out. And you don't put another one back in. And I think another big government solution to this problem would be like a cancer on our country. Expecting bigger government to solve a problem that big government created is, is ridiculous. We have to try something different. And I think that we've got to get the free market back into healthcare. Uh, back into healthcare via health savings account accounts across the board, no matter what your age or your socioeconomic status. I, I believe we should have a safety net. I believe we should have a safety net for the people who cannot care for themselves or who face something that is unexpected and need a hand up to get back on their feet and become productive members of society. Uh, Medicaid patients, I took care of many, many Medicaid patients in the time that I had my practice. And many times they were relegated to second or third class health care. I couldn't get the referrals that I needed as a primary care doctor to actually take care of the problems that they had. Uh, if they had a health savings account and they had a little bit of skin in the game, they'd be able to get what they need. If they need to go to the dentist, for goodness sake, they could go. Um, working age people, we should be able to put as much money aside for our health care needs as we see fit. I, I, somebody told me that their premiums went up from like $935 a month to $1,320 just in the last month or so uh, for a very healthy young family. Okay, can you imagine if you just had that $1,320 to put in your own health savings account that will actually accrue interest, probably low interest, but, and you could save that every month for, for years and years and years until you need it. Um, what, what a benefit that is to you. And if that could be passed on to your heirs. I mean, I think that that's the way we have to go. Why do we keep dumping money, like $1,320 or more, into the black hole of government or to the deep pockets of the insurance industry? Um, there, there's a way. The, and I'm not anti-insurance. My dad was an insurance agent, and he's a teacher, but he also used to sell insurance. Horace Mann insurance. Anybody that's out there that's a teacher uh, knows that's a teacher's insurance. Um, the, the insurance, health insurance, needs to be converted back to true insurance. Right now, it is basically you get it, and then you think you should use it, use it, use it, use it, use it, use it. Um, we should have catastrophic care coverage policies that are available that you can buy across state lines yeah. that take care of true emergencies like cancer or car accidents or very expensive long-term debilitating illnesses, pregnancies, and long-term care later in life. If we had that coupled with the free market and we could see whatever providers, you know, whatever physicians or other kinds of providers that we want to see. If you want to see a naturopath, why shouldn't you be able to? Why should you have to pay for your insurance and then go pay out of your pocket? If you want to see a chiropractor, if you want to see a, you know, a, a massage therapist, those should all be things that all of us can get to have the best health that we can. Because what was created was a way to say, give everybody a piece of paper to say, you have health insurance, but it did not and does not translate into health care. Now, I am the only mom in this race, and I am the only fiscal conservative in the race. So now you might say, well, how the heck do those things go together? Uh, well, but they, they do. They do go together because I worry, as, as a mom, I worry about the future. I, mean, I worry about the future for my kids. I worry about the future for their, their, their kids when they eventually have one. I worry about it for all of our kids and, and what we're leaving them. I love, love that the economy is growing. I love it. I think it's awesome. And it's awesome. The, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, was amazing. It was an amazing first step. It's not done yet. I mean, you know, it, we, we can't just look at the tax code every 31 years and expect that to be good. We can't wait for the next crisis. We have to be looking at that um, basically continuously to make sure that our tax code is fairer and flatter um, across the board uh, and lower, lower, much, much lower. I'd love to see the, the tax cuts become permanent, the individual tax cuts, and I'd also like to see the corporate rates come down, come down. Uh, more and more and more so that we aren't taxing prosperity and success. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, fa I'm a, a fan of the fair tax or the flat tax. Um, I think both of them have merit, so we, we need to look at that. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is the spending piece. 
And that's where the fiscal conservatism comes in, and the mom, because we are stealing from future generations. It's intergenerational theft, uh -huh. what is happening in Washington. In 2017, we took in enough money. Okay, we took in $3.3 trillion, trillion dollars. And what did the politicians last year do? Republicans, sorry, we were in charge of the House and the Senate um, and, and, and the White House, but the White House doesn't have anything, you know, they don't have that much control over the, the budgeting. That's the Congress. What did they do? They promptly spent $3.92 trillion. $3.3, $3.92, leaving us over $600 billion in deficit. Why? I mean, it's not, I mean, the interest is becoming a national security threat. The, the need to pay that back, that, that addiction to spending is becoming a huge problem. It's, well, it's been a problem, but it's becoming bigger and ballooning and ballooning to a point where um, we, we can't see past it. When, when you look at this week that, well, last week now, Rand Paul and Mike Lee, two of my favorites, just so you guys know, along with Ted Cruz. I, don't know, I think they're the trifecta I want to be able to work with in the, in the Senate. But, but uh, Rand and Mike proposed a to, to take on the president's rescission package. So cutting out spending, $15 billion, not, you know, not enough, but some, $15 billion of spending that we aren't even actually spending, that is either expired or programs haven't been re uh, renewed. And, so $15 billion, and we couldn't get 51 Republicans, okay? And, and they didn't need 60. They just needed 51. We couldn't get them because on the left and on the right, people are addicted to spending. Spend, 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 spend. And if we, when we have that $600 billion in deficit, we're borrowing it or we're printing it, which, again, steals from the future. Now, look at the omnibus bill, okay? And I hated the omnibus bill, just so you guys know. I, I, uh, I, I wish the president had vetoed it, and, and you remember, I don't know if you all were watching, but, you know, because I'm a junkie of the TV, you know, the, the political news. I don't have quite as many TVs, I don't think, as President Trump, that are around everywhere. But we generally have the news on, almost all the time. And I saw this new little room with a little table, and I was like, oh, it must be the veto room! But unfortunately, we haven't seen that yet. So we're, we're going to see the veto room. I hope it's for one of these immigration bills that they try to shove down our throats because the veto's it. But um, so he signed it, and I was disappointed. Uh, but I understand why he felt like he had to, because that bill was thrust upon him just as it was thrust upon us by Republicans. Um, they had a veto-proof majority, so it was going through come hell or high water. That bill was going through. But I was very heartened whenever he said, I will never sign another bill like this one. He looked right into the camera, and I believed him. I've met him. I met him um, in, in December, and he, he is a, a, an honest man. He is a, a, a very smart man, and so I believed him. I believed him when he said it. Now, unfortunately for us in Arizona, my two opponents, the two women that are running against me, both voted for that omnibus bill, okay? Uh, Martha, you know, sent out a press release after she signed it saying how proud she was. That was on March 22nd. March 24th, she figured out that everybody was, uh, thought that bill stunk, and she said, oh, 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 I mean, I had to hold my nose. So, you know, she, she said, she's playing the political game, and then, I mean, but she's been a big spender. When Rand Paul came out, he said that, uh, that he, he coined the term, he made a nickname for her, which I thought was kind of funny, was Mar Martha McSpender. So she is very spendy. Um, she, she voted for Obama's omnibus, too, in 2015. She's, she's just been a big spending Republican. And Cinema obviously, is a big spending Democrat who thinks that the government can take care of all of us and solve all of our problems, which we know is not the case. Um, some of the reasons why I would not have voted for the omnibus bill, I would have joined our members of the Freedom Caucus, Biggs, yeah. Uh, uh, Gosar and Schweiker, who all voted no on the omnibus. It has poison pills in it, guys, and we can't keep putting poison into bills that include things that we need, because we do need military funding. We need to make sure our military is strong. But we can't continue to make the country swallow the poison they're pushing on us. There was half a billion dollars in that bill to fund Planned Parenthood. It's a fun plan period. I'm never going to sign, you know, to, to sign off and, or vote yes on a bill that does that. We have to have people that stand up and say no. That organization, if it, if it you know, I mean, has plenty of donors for it to exist on its own. It should not be getting taxpayer dollars. 
It fully funded Obamacare, okay? The, the Republicans, our Republicans are telling us, Obamacare's done, we're done with health care, we don't need to do anything else, so that's all solved. No, they're still fully funding it, it's still there, it's, it's uh, been a game of smoke and mirrors. You might think, oh, there's some, some saving grace in there. It, uh, it had funding for the wall and for border security. No, no, that funding for walls and for border security was halfway around the world in the Middle East. There wasn't one new dollar for the wall in that bill, for our wall, and it actually cut funding for ICE. And so it was a terrible bill, and we should have had Republicans stand up and say, no, we're going back to the drawing board. We don't care if we shut down the government for a few days. We're going to make this better. There's some belief in Washington, D.C., if everybody's unhappy about a bill, then it must be a good bill. I think if everybody's unhappy about a bill, it's probably a pretty darn bad bill. Uh, across the board. So uh, so there's a lot of work to do on continuing to grow the economy, but we have to send fiscal conservatives to Washington from Arizona, and I'm the only one. The only one across the board, Republican, Democrat, and I heard that the, the Green candidate and the Libertarian are not going to be on the ballot because their signatures didn't stand up or they, re they withdrew. So it's going to be Republican versus Democrat come November. So last but not least, I'm a military wife, and Mike and I have been married for almost 23 years, in, in, in July, 23 years. And, and he served our country honorably for 33 years. And it, he was one of those kids who didn't know what he wanted to be when he grew up, and so he went, he, he came home one day and told his mom and dad, hey, mom and dad, guess what I did? And they were like, what? And they said, he said, I enlisted in the Air Force. And they were like, what? Uh, because he didn't know what he wanted to be. His dad's an architect and he's an engineer, and um, he didn't want to follow that path, but he didn't know what. And so he went into the military, and the military really shaped him into the, the person that he is. It gave him a career because they routed him to be a medic. Now, if you look at him, he looks like he'd be an MP, right? He'd be a policeman. He's tall, dark, handsome, tough guy. But, but he had taken one. EMT course and they made him a medic and that really made you know it, it opened his eyes to to medicine and he became he you know he, he went from enlisted he, he became an officer he went to medical school he's a and he was a flight surgeon um, in fact our state air surgeon in um, in Arizona when he retired last year in June and so as a military wife who has sent her husband into harm's way who sent the kids had to send their dad into Iraq and other places too, but not knowing if he was coming back. Not knowing if he was coming back the same guy. I, I know that our military has to be strong, and I want our military to be the strongest in the world. I want our men and women to have the best pay. I want them to have the resources, the training, the equipment that they need to win war if we go to war. I don't want us to be the police force of the world. I don't want endless occupation. I don't want expensive nation building. That has not been working. What I want is the Reagan doctrine of peace through strength. Yeah. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it in action with President Trump. As a, as a with President Trump as the commander in chief and with the rebuilding of the military that we are doing after Barack Obama and his administration tore it down for eight years, we are strong again on the world stage. We got out of the Iran deal. Oh, hallelujah. That was a terrible deal. Yes. Terrible deal, not just for us, but for Israel and really for the entire world to think that we are going to let, we can never let Iran get a nuclear weapon. I'm sorry, we just cannot do it. Uh, with, with moving the capital of, or recognizing the capital of Israel as Jerusalem, that is also peace through strength. That is peace through strength. What's happening with North Korea? With the negotiation, denuclearization, release of <laughs> None of those things happen from a position of weakness. So we have to continue to, to build our military and we have to take care of our veterans. Because now, you know, having a veteran husband and having taken care of veterans throughout my entire career as a physician, I understand that we have to stop using them as political footballs. We have to deliver on the promises to the men and women who signed on the lines to maintain our liberty and freedom, to maintain what makes this country so great. 
Um, and I, I look forward to working on that, especially on the healthcare side. Because not only uh, you know, was I a practicing physician that owned my own practice in primary care, I also was very involved in medical education for the last 20 years. I also did my master's in public health with an emphasis on health policy. I worked in a community health center and saw the inside of the safety net and then worked in the trenches in the emergency department. I got to take all of those things and actually put them to work in the policy arena as a state senator. So I've got a breadth of experience and knowledge that very few people have in our entire country. And, and if for no other reason, but I have a lot of other reasons, but if for no other reason for me to go to Washington, it's to address the health care issue for all of us and the health care issues for our veterans. And I look forward to getting there and getting that done. So if we do those things, if we build the wall, repeal Obamacare, grow the economy and control cut spending, and we build our military and take care of our veterans, our country will will continue to be great. We'll keep our country great, keep America great in 2018, 2020, and beyond. We have to have the right people go to Washington. We cannot afford Jeff Lake 2.0. I'm sorry, we cannot. And, and on the Republican side, Martha is Jeff Lake 2.0, if not worse. If you look at, you know, in, in language that she understands, because she loves to talk about that she's a pilot. Did anybody know? No. Oh, yes. She's a pilot, and, and I thank her for her service. I do. I, you know, I thank anybody who's willing to serve our country. But um, she's failed her check ride. Okay, that's language she can understand. That's a language aviation people can understand. She failed her check ride in the United States Congress. She is an F-rated Congresswoman across the board with every conservative organization out there. Heritage Action F. The American Conservative Union, F. The Freedom Works, F. Her Liberty Store, F. Uh, at one point with Freedom Works, she actually had a 9% when Cinema, the Democratic opponent, had a 10. So she's she's pretty dismal, but she wants to fool all of us, yep. just like everybody from the swamp wants to fool us. They yep. they they want to convince us during campaign time that there's something they're not. And I think Martha and Kirsten both have been kind of moving to the right. You know, I guess I should go this way. To the right. You know, they've been moving to the right. Um, but guess what? We don't need a cheap imitation. We need the real thing. Yeah. So I, I need your help to be able to do it. I appreciate your support and thank you for your votes. I need you to do a few things. Uh, when your sample ballots come, okay, it's going to be important with your sample ballots. And I was talking to, to you guys, the crawls over here. When they come, get them and fill them in. Okay, fill them in with Kelly Ward really big right at the top. It's, we're at the top of the ticket for the primary. And take pictures of them. Take a little picture with your phone and put it out there on social media that that's how you're going to vote. Email it to your friends that aren't on social media. And I know there are people that still like to get mail. Uh, you know, make copies of that thing, get a roll of stamps, and, and the number of stamps, you know, 100, 100 stamps, take those 100 stamps, get your Christmas card list out, the people that you send Christmas cards in Arizona, and send them that copy of your sample ballot and say, here's how I'm voting, here's how you should vote too if we want something better for our country. If we want to stop the insanity of doing the same thing again and again and again and expecting a different result, that you can help do it by doing that. It's very simple, it's very inexpensive. Um, and it makes a huge difference. Because if I send somebody my ballot and it says Kelly Ward, they're gonna say, ha ha, it's Kelly Ward. Yeah, of course she wants us to vote for her. But if you, who are in their circle of influence, actually send them something like that, whether it's electronically or, or with a piece of paper, it goes immeasurably far. So if you can do that, if you can join our social media army and retweet things and share this op-ed and share other things that are out there, that spreads the word. I know a lot of you are around my same age. You guys remember that Breck commercial where they had, and she told two friends, and she told two friends, and so on, and so on, and so on, and the whole screen was filled up with the beautiful women with their beautiful hair. We don't really care about the beautiful hair. We want a beautiful senator. We want a, a competent, qualified, capable person to go to Washington and represent us, finally, to have someone who is honest, who is, who is authentic, and who is accessible who can do the job in the way that we can finally say, 
we have an amazing senator from our state. So I, I look forward to that. I'm going to tell the yellow story because I told I told the ladies that thank you all so much for hosting us. It's beautiful and I love Rosati. And I love Rosati. Thank you. And, and it's amazing that you've had this place since 1986 and you've held strong through ups and downs of the economy. So keep up because the restaurant business is not an easy business. So so thank you for hosting us and showing us your success. Your small business really is the the driver of our economy. So thank you. Thank you. about the yellow shirts because you know, why did you pick yellow? Why did you pick yellow for your, your campaign? Uh, because I guess a lot of people don't like yellow, but I like yellow, just so you know. Um, and, you know I, I chose yellow and red for a number of reasons. Now, it wasn't because McDonald's and Burger King know yellow and red it sells, it shows up. It wasn't because as a when I was in college, I was a Chi Omega, and our colors were cardinal and straw, oh yellow and red. Is there, are somebody else a Chi Omega? No, it's a Chi Omega. Your daughter? All right. <laughs> so um, it wasn't just because of that. It wasn't um, just because Barry Goldwater used these very same colors, or even that the Gadsden flag and Don't Tread on Me proudly flies on a background of yellow. Um, it's because, number one, I do like yellow. I think that it is a sunny, positive um, color. It is a representation of the light that has to go to Washington and be shown on that swamp, on the left and on the right, so that we can get back to good yes. government, that we can have a representative republic. And I look forward to proudly holding that torch of liberty up uh, in Washington to shine that light and to bring forward smaller government and lower taxes and personal responsibility and following the Constitution. I can't do it alone, just like Moses couldn't hold up the staff by himself. I need you all to help hold that torch up because what I really want to see is AZ in DC, not DC in AZ, which we have had for far, far, far too long. Now we know it's hot, right? It's summer. Woo, it's heat wave. We, I think there's going to be a heat wave, not a blue wave, okay? We're going to bring the heat from here in Arizona. Bring the heat to drain the swamp. And I look forward for you to help me to do that. I look forward to it for you.